Thank you, Jacob, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. So as mentioned by uh, Jacob, I will talk about FAST and SDC. And this is, I will present the result of a joint work between Martin Gander, Daniel Ruprecht, and Robert Speck, and myself. Uh, so we started six months ago uh, on the project, a EU-funded project, uh, to investigate some particular thing about FAST. And uh, even if it has been already um, studied by many others, amongst them Daniel and uh, Warbett, uh, the idea was to you to have a theoretical framework to uh, have a fault tolerance analysis for FAST. Uh, fault tolerance is a subject that is actually of interest when considering high performance computing, and parallel time is one of these uh, subjects. So, um, the, it was actually uh, divided in three points that you have here, the theoretical prevent, then understanding fast on a simple problem, and eventually develop new forms of parallel in time algorithm. But the one we will focus on today is um, just fast on a simple algorithm. And I will divide my talk into two main topics. The first one being um, uh, the definition of some um, of the fast component and uh, it has been i mean we identified some something that we call the block sdc variant and uh, with that we i will also talk about some common framework analysis that we can use for parallel time algorithm and that is called the generating function method so first uh, i will present just a simple problem we were, we were analyzing, which is the Dahlquist equation with two eigenvalue, lambda minus one and i, um, that could simulate both parabolic and hyperbolic regimes. And as any um, time-stepping methods, we will divide uh, the integration time uh, OT between, between several intervals uh, of size delta t. Then we want to apply SDC, so we have to define the collocation problem. So when we consider the um, integrated form of the, uh, in the dif um, differential equation, uh, we can write into this form and we identify one integral here that will be between the beginning of the time steps and the time we want the solution in. Um, the idea is then to divide every time step here into quadrature nodes um, and what we call here is a block and each interval here uh, defined a node. And when we write that um, by approximating the function here as a polynomial that goes into um, the different value of the function here, we write the uh, discrete quadrature formula for one block uh, with two indices, indices, the one N that will be for the block um, position and m will be for the nodes inside the block. Um, so the equation we have here um, is defined using every value of the solution inside a block. And it is it uses uh, this q coefficient that come from a quadrature matrix. This quadrature matrix is just because we are interpolating the solution uh, by polynomials we have to in introduce the Lagrange polynomial associated to each node and the Q coefficient are just integration between the beginning of the time step and the node we are considering. Um, and that's how we build this whole Q matrix. And at the end, for one block, we can write here a solution uh, as a linear system that we want to solve. That's uh, UN is unknown and UN zero is actually the initial solution at the beginning of the node that for convenience for conveniency uh, will be repeated along one vector. So for one block, that's what we have. Then now when we, when we write it for every block, we can write this system, uh, which is kind of similar to what you already know for some of the problems, where we have on the diagonal part each uh, block problem. And on the lower diagonal, we have a H matrix that correspond to getting the solution from the previous block, um, I mean, getting the initial solution for one block using the solution from the previous block. And that's what is defined here. And that's the problem we have. And the hard FDC, uh, what we are doing when we doing SDC is, first we approximate Q, the Q matrix here by a Q delta matrix. 
And we use this preconditioned iteration um, that here I introduce where, I mean, it, it is based here on an initial solution uh, that I call uStore because we can put many things in here. But first, before uh, going to what uStore is, I will just consider what the Q delta is. The Q delta is actually an approximation of the Q matrix that you can see as the integral of an approximate uh, polynomials, Lagrange polynomial. Um, I mean, you, you integrate an approximation of the Lagrange polynomial, sorry. And to illustrate this, I can give you an example. Um, so here in this figure, you can see uh, five points uh, that are, uh, it's not low border points, that inst that's interior points. So you can see actually what's, uh, what's inside. And um, each Lagrange polynomial, here the blue uh, in the, this line, the blue one, you have the first Lagrange polynomial. And if you approximate it by a, conti a piecewise continuous uh, constant function here, like this, and you compute this integral, then you get for every here, this column, this value. Then you can do the same thing, let's say for the third Lagrange polynomial. Uh, here would be the Lagrange polynomial, the exact one. And here is the approximation. If we approximate it, then we will have only delta to three that will be here, but only when we integrate up to this point. If we integrate before, we have zero. That's why we get here a lower uh, triangular matrix with um, for all the value here, that would be zero. So that's the approximation that we have. We can do the same thing for forward Euler. So forward Euler would be, instead of having the continuous function here, will be, we'll have the continuous function on the, that will be non-negative on the right of the point. And then you can also get the trapezoidal rule by saying, I consider this function as go a zero, zero here, a triangle here, triangle here, and zero, zero, and so on. So that's, one way to do, we have many ways to do, but we, we don't go to the details. Then when we have that, we have the Q delta matrix, we can uh, actually define on each block what iteration will do. And sequential SDC, I mean, uh, classical uh, SDC would, would say that you consider one block, you do this preconditioned iteration up to the number of iteration you want to do. That's also called sweep. If I mentioned this term at some point in the presentation, but I'm, 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 I will try to stay with iteration. So we iterate on this block here at the end, and then we use the final solution as initial solution for all the other block, for, for the next block, for all iteration, and we iterate and so on. So that's a classical sequential um, uh, algorithm. And of course, uh, you have some error that you correct with the iteration. And we can see here on the that quiz problem that we had with six block, what happened. First, you can see that the error uh, in comparison to the collocation solution, that would be the uh, exact solution of your linear system, uh, decrease after some iteration, and then you get a in precision, so that's all right. And it's the same behavior for uh, both lambda. There is also another thing that happens, is that every iteration brings one order in the initial solution. So the order um, is computed using different meshes. I won't go into the details, but I mean, you, the idea is to get for the, I mean, first iteration and first interval, the order will be here. If you look at the second interval between the two dashes, that will be here. And we see that first iteration cover all the interval with our one order, then we increase for the second iteration, one order for all intervals the same way. There is, I mean, it's, uh, it's uniform and that's what we can ex expect from SDC, from the theoretical, theoretical representation of the, of the method. Then we can go to the two variants that we can define from SDC. The first one that I will call block gocidal SDC is the same iteration, except instead of waiting for the last iteration in the previous interval, we wait for the K plus one iteration to finish to get the initial solution. Why we call this block sidal? That's because if you consider the block formulation, the global formulation of this whole problem, then it's actually uh, this matrix here is use an approximation of the Q delta and uh, it's use um, 
um, a gocidal preconditioning of this problem. So that's why that's the name. Uh, the idea is that this actually introduced a pipeline parallelism. To illustrate that, uh, I will illustrate later, sorry. Um, but we can go even further. Instead of waiting for the k plus one iteration, we can wait just for the k iteration to finish and then perform our iteration. And that's what we call the block Jacobi SDC. Jacobi because we, are, we have here a diagonal, uh, sorry, this is actually an artifact that should be ignored. Only the diagonal um, are uh, non-null block matrix. And that's what is called generally for multigrid methods, a uh, Jacobi precondition. And this actually improve um, the parallelism that you get since you are not obliged to wait. I mean, you wait less to start in the next block, but of course it deteriorate convergence and we will see after why. So when we compare the two methods, so just looking at how we execute the iterations. So for block go sidel, when we execute one, we cannot start the other, the next, but once it's executed, we can actually start the next one and start the second iteration. And when this is done, we can start this block here and this block here and this block here, as long as this is done. But since these two can be done in parallel, that's, what, that's how you get a pipelined parallelism in here. First one, then second one, then third one, fourth, and then. So here in that situation, you can at some point after an initialization process, um, compute three uh, interval in parallel, just not at the same iteration number. And then block Jacobi here, since we wait only for the previous iteration to finish here, we can do this one, this one, this one, and then start with this one uh, using the solution here, this one, this one. So you, you can see there is way more parallelism, but since uh, this interval here, this block here, doesn't see the um, influence of the initial solution before the second iteration, then there will be a delay into the accuracy that it brings. In particular, there will be a delay into the order, the order that it brings to the uh, solution. To show you, uh, I mean, as I did for the previous one, the, um, I showed you the order increase for um, the Dahlquist equation. And for block goes idle, we can accept, we can accept that uh, since, uh, so I just go back a minute, since intuitively, if we have here one order in the solution, if we uh, transmit this condition, initial condition with one order accuracy to the second block, then the second block will start and can get first order accuracy here. And same for the first one, uh, for the third one here. So that's what we see here. Even if we don't wait for the whole previous interval to be completely computed, since we have still uh, an order of accuracy of the solution, it can be tra um, transmitted in all intervals in the next block. But for block Jacobi, we cannot. Uh, since here, here to get one order of, of accuracy, we have to wait to get the solution from here and to perform here the one order increase. So that's what you get here. Here, because the initial solution for the first block is already accurate, you get the first order of, of accuracy for the first iteration, but you don't get any for the other blocks. If you wait for the second iteration, then here you can increase. And since you increase here for the first uh, block, the second block can increase its order of accuracy and so on. And that's why you see this stir convergence for block Jacobi. And this can be seen also in the error that you get. For block Gossidel, we see that already there is a contraction factor and already there is convergence um, after the first iteration. But for block Jacobi, we have to wait an amount of um, iteration that is equal to uh, the number of blocks that we have to get after that the a similar convergence to what we get for block um, Gossidel. And this is due to this uh, transmission of initial condition that arrive uh, faster but don't um, bring the other of accuracy after some point. Um, so the first insight from this that we got was, uh, so we, we, we actually analyzed those two blocks, those two variants. Um, and the idea when we are building a fast step-by-step -step is that uh, if we conjugate block Gossidel and block Jacobi updates, we get one fast iteration. Uh, 
It's not already fast since we have to add also cautioning in time and space for blogocidal iteration. And also we have to take into account the initialization process for fast, which is a little bit um, complex in a way. So the next objective that I will uh, show you now is um, if we know actually the different block Gossidel and block Jacobi, uh, can we actually determine some error bound for those blocks and how can we combine them to get fast? So the idea is to base ourselves to a error recurrence formula. If you write, uh, for example, uh, with block Gossidel, uh, the error equation, so that's just putting the exact solution of the problem, I mean, the, the collocation solution, and rearranging terms. And then you get this uh, expression where when you apply the norm, any norm you want on this, and add to that the triangle inequality, you get this kind of error recurrence. That will be um, a recurrence considering two indexes. One would be the blocks indexes, and the other one would be the iteration. And then here, that's how we define the error. I mean, I think they're missing a k plus one here, but uh, n plus one here. So that's a mistake, um, but you can see the idea. And then we have those two coefficients here, gamma and beta, that are just norms of some matrix that we have inside the blocks. It's the same matrix along all blocks, so we can keep the same coefficient for everyone. So that's what is practical. And when we have this error recurrence, then we can apply what we call, what we call the generating function method. So the idea is just to start from this. It can come from any algorithm. It can be parallel, fast, um, block cosidal, anything you want, as long as you have this expression with the two indexes. Uh, and you can remark that I put a equal sign here because I don't care about inequality. It's just a near occurrence for the bound. We want to get a bound. We just we don't want to get the exact error. Then uh, the idea is to make this function appear. That's what we call the generating function. That is a power theory, which coefficients are simply the error for each block. And when we multiply here by uh, zeta to the power n plus one, and we sum over all terms, then we can have this recurrence uh, for one iteration up to the initial uh, generating function. And we have this term here. And if we take into account the initialization to get the expression for rho zero, uh, this is an example of what you can do. It's not always, I mean, you have other ways to do, but this is one example. Then you just have to uh, multiply this and identify the power series coefficient of this whole terms. So mathematically speaking, there's a little bit of uh, computation, but at the end, you still get an error bound by just ident identifying sorry, the terms in the power series representing this whole term. And to give you an application, I mean, some example, first one would be um, when we apply that on block Gossidel, we can see uh, a really nice similarity with block Gossidel and parallel. For block Gossidel, this is actually the error occurrence that I write again. And for parallel, this is the other uh, recurrence relation that we have with the alpha bar and beta bar coefficient are defined um, following parallel settings. So we don't care here about that. But just idea, the only difference between those two are actually this first term here. For parallel, it depends on the previous um, block, while for block Gossidel, it depends on the on the current block. And then the error bound here, that's the main difference that we have. And we can see it's a similar convergence, except for parallel, we have this minus key k here in the sum that gives you actually this uh, parallel mechanic convergence. When key k is equal to n, this term goes to zero and then it disappears, which we don't have for block goes idle. Uh, and also we can see that this, uh, the convergence is dominated, I mean, is um, influenced by the um, gamma k coefficient and that if it's less than one strictly, then we have contraction. And here is the expression of the gamma coefficient that only depends on the norm of the block matrix that we defined before. Another example would be when we apply to block, uh, block Jacobi. If we look at the L infinite norm for error computation and uh, error bound computations, uh, we can identify two regimes. 
the first one would be when k is equal to n, the error bound that we get is this one. Uh, this represents a state where you don't have done enough iteration and you're bounded by this term, which contract only if it's superior to one, but actually it's not. When you, I mean, when you compute that, it's not. So it's always what produced this kind of plateau here in the bound that you can see here also in the error. But then once you have actually do, do, done enough iteration, um, then you have a, a term here that contract with a gamma to the power k. And this term is actually just um, a, multipl like a, a multiplying constant, multiplicative constant, sorry. Um, and then the contraction is as for a block gocidal. And that's what you can see here in the bound and here there. Of course, we can mention that there is a huge discrepancy between those two bounds here in this bound, I mean, in terms of um, uh, the, the slope of the curve. And this is actually due to the norm we are choosing. The L infinite norms uh, doesn't get um, this um, slope of the error. If we use another norm, we can actually get this slope here, but this is another subject and I probably for another presentation. Uh, or publication, I, I don't know. But I mean, I, I won't go into the detail right now, but you have to know that even if the bound is not really tight, we can actually uh, have a tire bound using another norm. Uh, so to conclude, I, I presented this definition of different block SDC variants, and, and also uh, this idea of using the error recurrence between each blocks and each iteration uh, as uh, as if it could be like a standard framework for iterative parent and metam. You see that we can use it for parallel, for blog Gossidel, for blog uh, Jacobi. Then we can apply this on more complex uh, combination of blog Gossidel, blog Jacobi, and so on. And um, probably we can do that. I mean, M grids with F relaxation would be uh, also can be included in this framework. We can also analyze FCS relaxation probably with this framework and so on. So. That's actually something that could unify the analysis of every parent time method that could be helpful, especially since using the generating function, we can get um, the solution for the error occurrence that is the error bound. And these, those two are really powerful since using that we can analyze fast and also a block go side using coarsening. Um, I won't actually present that because it still have to be worked on just to give you a quick preview um, using uh, for fast, that's the generating function that you get. You just have to express this using the initialization and that, and then compute the uh, power series of all those terms. So a little bit computa um, computative, but that, that works, it's still doable. So um, to for conclusion, I would say that, um, so, there is still much to do, like writing a consist form for the error bound for fast. Could be actually, um, it could be really nice to have that. And then we can also select the correct norm to have a tire uh, bound. And that could be used for, uh, let's say, um, uh, practical use eventually. And um, also maybe that could be an idea see if we can use actually this error recurrence as a standard framework for parental methods, maybe we can develop some kind of condition on this error recurrence uh, for convergence or to have a convergence bound. Um, that could be similar to what we already have for, uh, let's say, a fundamental analysis. Uh, the uh, stability condition was first something that was um, graphic, a graphical representation between time step and um, um, a mesh step. And here maybe why not something between the iteration k and the number of block n plus one and the coefficient that we have in the error occurrence. But that's just some uh, small idea that I have just sharing that for you, but I guess um, we'll see what it gives uh, in the future. So that will be all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And here is all the credit that I have to, I mean, I have to thank every people that are behind. Amongst them are some institutions that uh, support uh, our project financially. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>